Baptist Church, our home church and worship headquarters in Manitoba. And it's another beautiful day on the prairies and it's good to be together again. How do I sound, everybody? I got some thumbs up there. All oh, right. Okay, we're good. My name is John Hunt. I'm the service host today and I stand up here on behalf of other people involved in the service today. Sheila with Zoom. We've got Carrie on piano. Uh, Clark Geats coming back to us for another message. And what am I missing? Haparco on Zoom, who is uh, responsible for producing and head quarter, uh, quarterbacking this right here, our order of service. Thank you for all your uh, work and labors of love. So uh, some, announce <laughs> some announcements this morning. Um, I'm going to say what I planned on saying, which was uh, I'm only going to highlight the immediate things. and. For things further away, I'd like you to refer to this bulletin that has no uh, nothing further out. So I will refer you to the website, which I'm going to take my own um, advice here, and talk about things further away to start with, which is Friday movie night, November 1st. And we've got uh, uh, music, and I can't see that. It's on the screen behind you. Oh, it's on the screen behind us. So we've got a music night ahead of us too. And I assume that the date is there and everything we need to know. Saturday the 26th. Okay, that's coming right up. Thank you. Um, okay, the Hallmark movie shoot for Yonder Star is complete. Um, they have put almost everything back where they got it, uh, with a few exceptions and probably more to come that we don't know about. And it's part of the reason we're maybe a little bit late starting here this morning. Uh, connections deadline is tonight at midnight. 
Um, and if you don't already have your submissions in, um, please do so well in advance of that deadline. And well in advance is starting to become more and more difficult. Thank you, Susan, for your continued work on this labor of love of yours. Anyone who eats lunch is invited downstairs after service for potluck. Uh, there's normally lots of leftovers, so if you've come uh, caught this unexpected, um, please come down. And I understand that there may be lots and lots of extra food here today. Uh, recently, we had a potluck that was almost all dessert. No main course. And where else but a church can you get away with something like that? But it doesn't look like that's going to happen today. Uh, a note on our security system, and it seems to be working very well, and anyone with keys needs to have their own unique passcode. And I'm getting notifications for the startup of this system every time somebody comes and goes, so I see what's happening. And there's still somebody using an old passcode. So uh, it's working now because it's, it's uh, effective for a little while longer, but one morning there's going to be a surprise, and it's going to be an interesting one. So let me know if you don't have a code. Also, thank you for your continued support of this church and mission. And together, our gifts of talent and generosity keep this church afloat and a blessing to all that are able to come here. Um, your financial gifts also help keep the heat and the lights on, as well as support the people who need help. So offering can be given through an e-transfer to the church as well as given right here in this sanctuary or in the offering plate over here. Uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And as part of your financial gifts, there's an opportunity as well to remember Don Miller with uh, a designation that will go toward upgrading the common room at the Madison. And the Madison is where Don lived for a long time. And Don was a quiet guy who sat at the back over there with a big beard and uh, he was one of my favorite scripture readers because he would come up here with his gravelly voice and sound like Leonard Cohen reading us scripture. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. So not the least of uh, God's blessings are the land we live on and the water that we drink. And each of these was given to the indigenous people and Métis uh, nation who were here long before us. We can live here because of the treaties signed by these people and the government on our behalf. And that makes you and me treaty people. May God grant us an understanding of the relationship we have with the people who lived here before us. And may the first people and Métis nation have patience with us as we gain that understanding. So our worship service begins with uh, a call to worship, and that time is now. And it's now that we are invited to open our minds to God in a way that we may not do any other day of the week. Now is the time to be at peace with one another and set aside your stress and worries for an hour. We all have unique and special things to worry about, but I assure you that they will be waiting for you when we are done. Worry. This week I heard an interesting description of worry. Worry is an unspoken prayer for things that you don't want to happen. We're worshiping a God that can do anything, including looking after little things. We pray to a God of action who can accomplish anything when we ask for help, and we work in the belief that with our God's help, his will is done. In this hour of worship, on this Sunday, in the heart of the fall, in our little corner of creation, our worship matters. We are God's people, and we believe that God is worthy of our praise. So worry not. God is in control. The Lord is the upholder of our lives. Amen. O oh, Spirit on us, breathe with life and strength anew. Find in us love and hope that trust and lifts us up to you. We're going to continue our worship singing some of those words uh, with the opening hymn, We Lay Our Broken World in Sorrow at Your Feet. And that comes from the Book of Praise, number 202. Carrie.
and then there's another thing and another thing and uh, so anyways we have the shoe boxes cardboard boxes downstairs at the door after you have gone downstairs to eat our lovely lunch and um, you can pick up a cardboard box and fill it with nice toys for children overseas so let's pray at this time uh, dear God uh, thank you for your life that you uh, gave on the cross for us. And uh, thank you, Lord, that we can come here and worship you. We take, don't take this for granted because there are many places in the world that don't have this freedom. And we ask you that you be with them, be with the pastors and the lay people that work hard for the children and the moms and dads that are gathered together. I think of um, the people in our church that are at home now for Carol and Eleanor, Vivian, Joyce, Bill and Alice Marie, Ken, Byron, Irene, Kent, Bob, um, Kevin's mom and dad, uh, in-laws, Don and Kathy, Donna, Sandra, Kathleen, and Susan. We just commit all these people to you and help them to know that we have, haven't forgotten them. And if they were here today, we would be so happy to see them. I think of um, if people have been watching uh, the news uh, lately, we know that our country's in turmoil, our government is upside down. And um, I think of Justin Trudeau's children at this time. And um, it's the children that get shuffled and hurt by things. Uh, commit them to you, Lord. I pray for people in the community, for Christian people for Christian students that would surround these children at this time. And uh, I pray for our, the states and for their election coming up. Many of us have relatives there and friends, and we wish them the best. That's the bottom line. We want to have the right person come in. So I just pray, Father, that everybody will go out and vote for the right person that they believe that is supposed to be there in, in um, office. So we thank you, Lord, that you look after us and that um, you're pleased with us, that we're gathered here. And we think of those that can't be here, that are sick, crippled or ill or have sickness that keeps them 
bound at home. We commit this in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Ruth. Our hymn of approach this morning is God Meant It All for Good. And that's a hymn I don't recognize, but a title that cannot be doubted. Raymond and Kerry, over to you. All right, friends, this is a new song. It is one that Iparco has found in his time with family in Nicaragua. And uh, it has a very folk song kind of feel to it. And because it is new, we would like to teach you the chorus of it by singing it through once before we go back to the beginning. And you'll hear that the verses are directly uh, inspired by the scripture that Clark is about to share in a message with us this morning. And so you'll think back to Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat, uh, that whole story of family separation and uh, hardship and loss, and then well, the song and the scripture and the message bring it all together. Um, let's look at the chorus. And so I'm sort of springing a surprise on Carrie on page two there. Um, and I think Sheila has a slide up. Yeah. So the words are God meant it all for good. Let's sing or have a look at the words first and then they'll be familiar to you when they come back again. God meant it all for good. Back on what he's brought me through, I see things as I should. Though at times I did not understand, it was part of his determined plan. He's worked all things together, like he said he would. And God meant it all for good. That gives you an idea. Let's try. Yeah. 
Clark back to our pulpit. Uh, this is his fourth time here in 2024. Well, huh? <laughs> he also gave me the um, the very assuring uh, uh, opportunity that if we were ever in a fix to give him a call without the promise of actually saying he'd say yes, but uh, he would be happy to accept the call. So, <laughs> so he really needs no introduction here. But uh, it's good to have you back. Thank you. And on behalf of this family of uh, believers, I'd just like to offer a prayer for you. Sure. God, thank you for the people who bring messages to us each week. Your words, God. And today we thank Clark for bringing his his wisdom and his words to this pulpit, uh, to this pulpit and this sanctuary. Lord, be with him and be with us as we hear this word. Amen. Amen. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be back with you again. My message this morning is going to be a little different, a little more personal, and uh, uh, so we'll, we'll find out what that means in a moment, but I would also like to pray, John, not to, not to gild what you said, but, but to uh, add my own petition. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can be here together today. We want to hear your voice speaking to every one of us. Now we ask that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to accept and rejoice in what you tell us. In your name, amen. I'd like to tell you three stories this morning, the stories of three different people. And I want to start by telling you a bit of my story. Parts of it you might know, Parts of it might be new to you. I was born 66 years ago in the town of Emerson, which is just right down on the border where the Red River enters Canada. My family lived there because my dad was a Baptist pastor at the church there. And uh, we were there for a short time after I was born. And then we moved because in those days, pastors moved around a lot like military families, like RCMP, like bank managers. It seemed like they were always on the move. So I was preschooler in Moose Jaw, uh, in Regina, an elementary age kid, living on all a street of all names, Lakeview Avenue in Regina, an adolescent in Calgary, and a most likely obnoxious teenager in Thunder Bay. Maybe you've lived in some of those places yourself. Uh, maybe you've had that same experience of moving on a regular basis and you know that kind of thing in your own life. But for me, growing up in a Christian home was great. I was soaked in the gospel from infancy. I went to Sunday school. I went to something we called mission band. I don't know if they have it anymore. I attended a Longbow Bible camp out near Kenora every summer as a kid. And as a teenager, I was in our church youth group and in the Christian group in high school. And those last two were particularly important to me at the time because that's where you got to meet girls. 
And I even went to Bible school in, in Calgary after I graduated high school. So my path to faith in Jesus as my savior was a really easy one. I know that's not the case for many people. They struggle, they go through crises and, and they come to the Lord in, in dark moments. But for me, I think God prepared the easy way because he wanted to be easy on me. I don't know, I give him thanks for that blessing. One of the things I did not ever want to do was to be a pastor. Too many meetings, too many people to be nice and polite to. Every Sunday you're tied up. No, not for me. However, it seems the Lord had other plans because when I was studying here at the University of Manitoba one day, he tapped me on the shoulder and he directed me to prepare for ministry. So I moved to Vancouver for seminary and that's where I met my wife-to-be, Rosie. Well, I didn't know she was my wife-to-be at the time. Actually, pretty sure she wasn't going to be my wife because we had chats and she too had grown up in the church. She went to a church in Edmonton and then when they moved to Vancouver, she grew up in that church. And she knew what it was like to be a pastor's wife and she said, there's no way I'm interested in that kind of life. So she wasn't gonna be a pastor's wife. We were comfortable with having no plans, no future, no threat of any kind of relationship building. So we hung out as friends, pals. Well, <clears throat> you know what happened? After a year of being just friends, nothing more really, we kind of got attached to each other. And we realized that we actually wanted to be together for life. And so that was solemnized on May 17th, 1985 at West Vancouver Baptist Church. The next year I was called to pastor a little church here in Winnipeg's North End. So the two of us moved here and we were actually carrying our um, first child. We didn't know it at the time. We thought Rosie had the flu. Other people knew better than us. And uh, we came here as a family of two and a half or three, depending on how you look at it. We thought we might be here in Winnipeg for maybe five years and then somewhere else. But God had other plans. It was 22 years that we were actually here. Along the way, we had three wonderful kids. They're all still living here in Winnipeg with their spouses and their kids. And we have eight beautiful grandchildren and the Lord has blessed us tremendously. Pastoring in the North End was a growing experience for me. I learned a lot in that little church and some of the people there are still good friends today. I learned how to be a real pastor to real people. And an older pastor in our ministerial here in Winnipeg, actually he was from this church, Stuart Frame, if, if you might remember that name. Um, he told me one time in our ministerial that Pampers had come out with a new line of earmuffs. And I knew all about Pampers because we had a newborn in the house at that time. But I thought, why is Pampers coming out with a line of earmuffs? And he says, it's for young pastors who are still wet behind the ears. <laughs> Twelve years later, the Lord led us to pastor another church here in Winnipeg in East Kildonan. And I was there for another 10 years on top. So it was a wonderful and rewarding time of ministry for us here. And well, then my wife's company offered her a position in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. So I resigned from the church and Rosie and I moved to the West Coast. It turned out that there weren't any ministry positions open for me at that point, but the Lord provided me with a job at BC Ferries and uh, so Rosie left her job and moved to Salt Spring Island. It's one of the Gulf Islands, you might have heard of it, maybe even visited, so that I could work there. During our four years there, I kept my eyes open for a, a pastoral position. And finally, a door opened to serve a small church in Comox, BC, which is again on Vancouver Island. We were happily engaged, involved in pastoral ministry there among some wonderful people until 2020. 
And that was a year of great disruption all over the world. Just at that point, something I was not expecting happened and it turned our lives upside down. But I'm gonna pause my story there because I wanna tell you a second story which you might already know a good deal about. In fact, we just sang a song about it. Now this is Joseph's story. He lived a long time ago, about 3,800 years. And a story comes to us in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, beginning at chapter 37, and the next 13 chapters to the end of the book are all about Joseph. Well, there's one chapter, but that's a side thing. It is an amazing story. It's got twists and turns and highs and lows, and, and really somebody should make a movie or a musical about it because it's so dramatic. Joseph lived in an area called Canaan then. It's roughly where the modern day state of Israel is today. And families back then were quite different too. Uh, a patriarch could have multiple wives, could have multiple servants, and could have many, many children. And that's exactly what happened in J uh, Jacob's, uh, sorry, Joseph's family. His dad was Jacob. Later in life, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. There's something significant about that too. But Jacob had 12 sons with different wives. Most of them were older than his son Joseph. The older brothers absolutely hated that he was Jacob's favorite and that Joseph got special treatment from their father, including being given a fancy multicolored coat. It would be like having a family, buying your favorite child a Ferrari, and the others having to ride around on rusty bicycles. That was the kind of family dynamic they had. But what finally sealed Joseph's brother's anger and hatred against him was that God gave Joseph two dreams and the dreams symbolized his brothers and his father bowing down to him. Unthinkable, the older brothers and the father literally bowing down. And so when Joseph told his family about these dreams, they were incensed, they hated him even more. And when he went out to meet with them in the fields one day, they plotted to murder him and to claim to the father that a wild animal had eaten him. Thankfully, Judah, one of the older brothers, stopped them Instead, they sold Joseph to some slave traders who were going down to Egypt. Now, I want you to notice two things so far about this story, and of course, I'm just skimming this, the surface of it. First, it was Joseph's own brothers who wanted to murder him out of their jealousy. Now, you may know this personally, but sometimes families are not safe places. They're supposed to be but sometimes it's our own family members who can cause us the greatest harm, the most grievous wounds. Being related to someone doesn't mean they're safe. The second thing to notice is that Joseph's two dreams were authentic prophetic dreams from God. Later, of course, they came uh, true exactly as they revealed what happened. So when Joseph told his family about these dreams, he wasn't bragging. He was simply giving testimony to what the Lord had told him. So notice that when God speaks, some people react with anger and slurs and rejection. They don't like the message or the messenger, and they let you know about it. But when someone's heart is inclined towards God, they receive what he says with acceptance and joy. So there was young Joseph, about 17 years old or so, 
taken away to be sold in a slave market in Egypt. But things started to, to, to look up for him because a high official bought Joseph to work in his own household. So Joseph got a job working for a rich, influential man, having food and a place to live. What more could you ask? And of course, he worked hard, he, his, his uh, responsibilities flourished, the master put him in charge of everything in the house, and he was on a career path uh, trajectory that we would call very, very positive. <laughs> yes, but the official's wife took a shine to this young slave because he was strong and handsome. She put the moves on him. After, day after day, she would say to him, come to bed with me, come to bed with me. And Joseph tried to duck out. He tried to avoid being together with her alone, but still come to bed with me. And that put him in a dilemma. He could comply with her desires and, and probably later get caught and executed, or he could resist her and be falsely accused of rape and be put in prison. Terrible choice, but that's the one he chose. So, almost murdered by his brothers, sold into slavery, falsely accused by his master's wife, thrown into Egyptian prison. I don't think that Joseph's experience was all that rare. Have you ever been falsely accused of doing something that you didn't do? Have you ever been framed for a harsh accusation? Many people go through that kind of experience. You probably know a bit of what Joseph was going through. But guess what? God was still with him there in prison. There he encountered two of Pharaoh's servants who were also in prison. He looked after them. And when they both had dreams, strange dreams they couldn't figure out, God gave the prophetic meaning of those dreams to Joseph. He told them the meanings and both dreams were fulfilled just as God had said. Fast forward now. Joseph's God-given abilities to interpret dreams were needed in the royal palace. Pharaoh himself had had two mysterious, disturbing dreams, and Joseph gave the meaning of those prophetic dreams to him, and then the Lord opened the doors for Joseph to be put in charge of the whole realm. God had shown Pharaoh that there were going to be seven days of plenty coming, followed by seven days of drought, and the kingdom needed to be prepared. You know, when God gives us a warning about a bad thing that's coming, it's for our benefit to listen and to heed. The foretold seven years of plenty were heavily taxed because that's how uh, Joseph had set up the system. Abundant stores of grain were laid up. And then during the subsequent four, uh, seven years of famine, the people had grain to buy from the warehouses. This famine wasn't just restricted to Egypt. It was great and widespread. So people from all different lands were coming to Egypt, the only place that had this stored up grain because Egypt had been prepared by the Lord's warning. Now here's where Joseph's story gets really interesting and really personal. Because his own family had to come to Egypt to buy grain so they wouldn't starve too. By this time, Joseph is almost 40 years old. He speaks Egyptian. He's dressed like an Egyptian official. He uh, probably has the, the usual makeup that a high official would have. His own brothers did not recognize him when they came. And you can just imagine Joseph's feelings, seeing his brothers who had betrayed him so badly coming literally bowing down before him just as God had prophesied would happen in Joseph's early dreams. 
This is one of the most moving passages in the Bible. The brothers had been arguing among themselves about giving account for the, the blood of their young brother, Joseph. And it says in Genesis 42, they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He heard them, he understood them. They didn't know that he understood. And it says, he turned away from them and began to weep. 20 years, tw more than 20 years of, of the pain that he had been carrying and his own brothers uh, in front of him now admitting what they had done. Well, it goes on, Joseph finally revealed himself to them as, his, as their brother. There were some back and forths to collect the family. Eventually the whole clan, including the father, Jacob, Jacob slash Israel, came down to Egypt and lived there under Joseph's protection. They survived the famine and they prospered. All was well, right? All was well. Eventually, at the great old age of 147, their father Jacob died. And this troubled the brothers, though. This troubled them. Because, let me read this passage from Genesis 20. This is our scripture portion this morning. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and paid us back pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now, please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Powerful. You intended to harm me but God intended it for good. That is so amazing that even though Joseph had suffered rejection and betrayal by his own family, and because of this had suffered slavery and imprisonment in Egypt, yet even so, he was able to look past the evil actions of his brothers and see the mighty hand of God at work. Notice that he didn't minimize or, or sweep away what the brothers had done. You intended to harm me. But more importantly, he saw how God in his sovereignty had brought great good out of their evil intentions and actions. He saw how his own people, God's chosen people had been preserved through the great famine. He saw how God had protected and blessed them in the past and he knew that God would protect them and bless them in the future. So that's Joseph's story. I encourage you to take some time, maybe even this afternoon, start reading in Genesis 37 to get all the cool little bits that I didn't have time for this morning. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. 
Now, before we go on to the third person story, I want to come quickly back to my story and just finish it up. Rosie and I had been living in Comox for seven and a half years. We were happy. I even hoped that I might be able to retire there. But on August 10th, 2020, in a normal monthly leadership team meeting, the leadership team told me they didn't want me there anymore. It wasn't because of professional misconduct on my part. It wasn't because of moral failure on my part. They just decided they didn't want me to be their pastor. I was completely blindsided, shocked, blown away. It was like an emotional shotgun blast to the face. When I had to go home and tell Rosie, it was the most dismal experience of my life. It meant we would have to move away from our cozy home there, away from our friends, including some dear people in the church. But in those days of pain and turmoil, as we sorted out what needed to be done, the Lord gave me this verse, these words of Joseph's. The people on that leadership board had secretly plotted. They had conspired together. They had intended to harm me. But God intended it for good. I don't really like to share hero stories about myself, but this is a factual testimony of God's grace to me and Rosie. He preserved us through that experience. He opened doors for the quick and smooth sale of our house and for our move to come back here to Winnipeg, that he was with us in every step of the way. I'm, I'm not in any sense comparing myself to Joseph. But I am saying that the God of Joseph, who guided and preserved him, even though others intended evil for him, the God of Joseph is the same God who guided and preserved me through that big change. God intended it for good. Praise his name. Now to finish up, I told you that there were three stories, and I've told you my story, I've told you Joseph's story. The third story is your story. I don't know your story, but you do. Maybe if you and I had some time, we could sit down together, I'd hear your story. We could probably go through several mugs of hot chocolate and a number of cookies in the process of visiting and you telling me your story. Your story, I'm sure, would e include experiences like Joseph's and like mine. I'm sure that at some point, you have been betrayed, maybe even by your family or close friends. I'm sure that you have experienced being falsely accused or even framed in ways that hurt you deeply. I'm sure that there are people who have hated you for no reason. And God knows all these things. He's been with you through all of these experiences and all of these hurts and all of these wounds. Others may have brought evil against you, may have intended to harm you. But you know what? God intended it for good. One of the verses every believer should memorize after John 3.16 is Romans 8.28. And I, John, I don't know how many of the four messages that I brought here to you have included this, but here it is again. Romans 8.28. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. My dear sister, my precious brother, this is God's promise to you that in every experience in your life, every circumstance, every up and down, that is something that he takes 
and works out to your good. And he's the only one that can do this. He can do it because he's God and he will do it because he loves you. Don't let sin, uh, uh, regret, sorrow, or bitterness cloud your understanding. That even though there might have been some who intended to harm you, to do you evil, God intended it for good. God intended it for good. Let's pray. Father God, you worked miracles in the life of Joseph, and his story is written in your word so that we could learn more about you and how you act and how you care and how you love, and you bring about your plan for good. We know that in our lives, you have been with us through those times when we've been betrayed or framed or hated. Father, we trust you that you are working it for good. Help us always to remember you intended it for good. In Jesus' precious name we ask, amen. Thank you, clerk. I don't actually like to do this, or, uh, I, but I'm going to do it anyway. I don't because your message stands on its own, and I normally would send an email to thank you for it afterward on the Monday, which I try to do for our guest speakers. But I'm going to say something today that thank the God meaning it all for good. The timing of your message is very interesting because we have been following this uh, personal confessions series over the last uh, month or so, and. And Stephen Klippenstein is here. I saw him, uh, there he is back there. He started us off about a month ago, and that was followed the next week by me and Charlene. And uh, we had an off week there, but uh, these confessions are, are uh, and personal stories are very meaningful. And I remember when we first started communicating, I uh, observed that your retirement was going the opposite way of most people, where they move west and you came back here. and. Now I have the rest of the story, so I'm sorry for my flippancy in that, in that email. But uh, um, there was one other thing I wanted to say there. Um, anyway, th thank you, thank you for your message. I will have to email you what I also had in my mind, but I got off track there. Our closing hymn today is uh, "Goodness Is Stronger Than Evil" by Desmond Tutu, and Desmond Tutu is an, as well as being a, a, a beautifully lyrical name, was something somebody that we just always knew about back in the in the 90s and the and the 80s and i had to remind myself of why that was and he is the anglican or was the anglican bishop in south africa and he led the uh the the uh, protest against the human atrocities that were going on and with the apartheid system in south africa so he has uh he is the composer of this closing hymn, which is, Goodness is Stronger Than Evil. And I've been warned by Raymond that this starts off a little bit awkwardly, but he also assures us that it was going to work out just fine in the end. Or did I... That was I, for the first hymn. That was for the first hymn. Okay. <laughs> okay, so... This is all good. Carry and Raymond. Well, this is going to be a wonderful song. Thanks. Carry and Raymond. Oh,
Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Amen. Thank you. 